really great to see such a nice, small, intimate group of friends, um, familiar faces, unfamiliar faces, but uh, I'm really glad that um, for those of you who are ETAs that you all trekked out here from your various places, I really do appreciate that. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank um, the Fulbright Foundation and Director Jayok Shin, who's not here this evening, but um, I'm really appreciative to have this opportunity to come to Korea for the first time and also be a part of this amazing journey and family, the, the Fulbright Research family, the ETA family, just everyone in general. And I made really great friends along the way too. So it's, it, all in all, it's been a really transformative experience and it's only three months into the grant for me. So I can't wait to see what happens um, at the conclusion of my grant. So this is my presentation and let's get started. So I'm gonna start off with the motivation for this evening's talk. And I want to share with you all my research that I've done thus far. And I want to introduce energy policy studies. So I think a lot of us understand energy politics in some facet, uh, whether it's from the environmental side, you know, recycling, a hybrid car, that kind of stuff, or if you understand through the economics or the politics, etc. The point is, is that we all see energy through different lenses. And I'm going to try to show to you this evening that um, energy is very interconnected with a whole range of disciplines. You'd be very surprised. Um, if, you, if you study something like gender studies, you'll say, how does gender studies possibly connect with energy? And I will prove that to you this evening, so wait for that. And I want to share, again, you know, interconnectedness, and I want to share the progress that I've done thus far, looking at this idea of uh, political anchoring, and seeing how that implement, uh, influences voting, and how Korean citizens uh, interpret en uh, energy, nuclear energy, through these uh, political lenses. So a little bit of a roadmap for this evening. So part one, so around 40 minutes-ish um, is my talk. I know it sounds kind of long. Even it was daunting for me to be like, how do I feel 40 minutes? Um, but I want to share with you my journey to like, how did I even get involved in energy studies? Um, because I'm not uh, an engineer. I'm not, you know, um, I don't come from the hard sciences or, or that perspective. So it's like, how does a social science person get into energy policy studies? And then I'm going to introduce to you my host institution. And then we're going to tr jump into a brief survey of the Korean landscape and then look at some challenges. And then I will introduce my research on political anchoring and voting. And then I want to discuss the importance of interdisciplinary studies and the importance of getting more voices from the social sciences <coughs> in this discussion. And then I'm going to conclude a little bit with about future energy policy challenges. With respect to this recent rapprochement that we have seen between North Korea and South Korea, that's been a lot in the news. Um, I mean, even in this past week, right, um, when uh, North Korean soldiers and South Korean soldiers crossed the border, and there was a nice show of um, cooperation there. And then also looking at the geopolitical impacts with Russia and China as well. And then the last part is about roughly 20 minutes uh, for question and answer, but I know the pizza is going to come in, so we're just going to go straight to that. <laughs> um, so how did I get into energy politics? So it all started with my junior year slash sophomore spring. So I took a class with a professor in international relations. So it was U.S. foreign policy. And he put a call out for research assistance. So he said, you know, here's what I do. And one of them was energy in the Middle East. And I said, I don't do the Middle East, I'm more East Asia, China, but hey, why don't we do a joint research project on Chinese energy policy? And I said, okay, let's do it. So I applied for a grant, we got that, and then I spent my fall semester looking at Chinese energy policy and energy security. So that was my first introduction to energy studies. And then in uh, my junior spring, I studied abroad in Taiwan. I went to um, an intensive language program to study Mandarin. And on the side, I, I did independent research on Taiwanese energy security to expand my um, previous work on China. And then also, that was my first introduction to Northeast Asian energy policy. So um, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and North Korea, the, these essentially islands um, all share pretty similar energy challenges. And then, uh, in the bottom right, I actually play, I love tennis, and I actually played tennis inside of an active nuclear power plant. Um, so in, in doing the independent research, I went to different places, and I went to a community where there's a nuclear power plant in, in the community, and through connections, I got to play tennis with a friend, and having those conversations with people was very interesting, um, because a lot of times we don't hear those voices. And <clears throat> I was pretty surprised, I, a lot of people said, we're actually supportive of nuclear, because it 
provides our town a subsidy. We can use that for developing roads, infrastructure, etc. Um, because in my mind, I'm like, well, aren't you scared of Fukushima or something crazy like that? The vast majority of people said no, actually. And that made me think a lot about the 2016 American election. Uh, when you think of Pennsylvania and coal country, right? How they came out in huge support of President Trump um, because of energy, right? Because um, I think Hillary Clinton was saying, no, we're going to scrap coal, uh, move to renewables. And, and you can, I began to empathize with people who worked in that industry that was going to be shut out. Similarly, Taiwan is moving um, or was moving towards a policy to phase out nuclear. So interestingly enough, I was able to part, um, piece some things together. So that transitions to my senior year where I wrote my honors thesis on Japanese nuclear energy policy. Because in order to understand the current situation of how these countries, Taiwan, um, South Korea, think about their nuclear policy, we kind of have to look back at uh, Fukushima as this uh, flashpoint, right? Where everyone in the region, also the world too, Germany, Italy, they changed their uh, nuclear policy, even despite being that far away. So that helps to understand the present um, situation of the, the regional policy. And then also, it made me think a lot about energy diplomacy. Uh, it made me think about how um, we hear about the Middle East, right? Oil, They're the black gold, essentially. And how the Middle East can leverage oil for political gain. So again, using energy as a diplomatic tool um, for an advancing agenda. So where am I located? I am located at Hanyang University. Has anyone heard of Hanyang University before? Okay, good. Like, I hadn't before I applied. <laughs> um, um, so it's located in the west of, uh, no, east of Seoul, near Wangxin, so like out there near Tamsil. So from here, I just hop on the, is the purple line the six or the five? five. The five. So I take that directly <laughs> to Wangxin, I switch over one uh, to the green line number two, and then Hanyang Day is, all, is one stop away. So I think I read that Hanyang Day is the only university to have a metro stop right on the campus itself. So it's very convenient. Every time I have to go to another university, I'm like, I have to take a taxi. It's not, it's not convenient. The little things. So I want to introduce you to my team. So on the far right is my supervisor, Professor Yonggu Kim. And he is a professor of uh, within the Division of International Studies. So if you think about where you all went to college, you know, there'd be a College of Humanities, Fine Arts, um, engineering, etc. So there's one college called International Studies. So he's a professor there and uh, I'm supporting his research projects. Also he has a little thing called the Global um, Energy Monitor, so I help him sort of solicit articles and um, do that for him. And then in the middle is Jimin Kim. She's a research assistant that supports me. It's like, what? I have a research assistant? It's ridiculous. Um, so she's a junior and she's a double major in political science and international studies. So she'd actually studied, um, she'd actually lived in the US for about around five years. So her English is very, very fluent. Her English is amazing. I think she scored like 100% of the TOEFL. Um, and she's really great. She helps me with translation tasks, other things like that, supporting the professor. Um, and then also uh, what I really appreciate is, or what I like especially about our dynamic is that I'm able to mentor her and give her guidance because she's a junior right now. And I think we can all remember like what it was like being in junior year. It's like, what do I do? Do I work? Do I go to grad school? Like, so I was, in the, I was in the throes of that a couple years ago. So it's really cool to be like, oh, like, this is my experience. How can I help you? So we have a lot of fun with that. So I'm going to show now transition into a survey of the Korean energy landscape. So in order to get some um, audience participation, I want to play one game with you all. So um, what do you, so if we can kind of imagine like a pie chart or 100%, like what, what fuel sources do you think Korea uses the most? And like what percentages do you, would you like ascribe to it? Like coal, X percent, oil, blah. What do you all think? Yeah, what's your I name? I think they use coal like 75%. Okay, great. Any other guesses, resources? It's a small group. Nuclear 20. Nuclear 20, OK. Any, any other before I drag out this beaten horse? OK. Uh, <laughs> OK. <laughs> so we can't really see it, but good thing I wrote this up. So petroleum, other liquids is 44%, that huge blue. Um, so coal is actually 29%, um, and, but you're not off in the sense that it, it represents a huge portion of Korea's energy uh, consumption because in 2017, it was the world's fourth largest coal importer. And behind that, uh, number one is China, 
Uh, after that is India, and following that is Japan. So Korea, not, not far off that. Uh, natural gas is 14%, it's the third largest world's, uh, third largest importer of liquefied natural gas, often referred to as LNG. Uh, nuclear, uh, I think you said 22 per half of it, but your, your intuition was really close in, a, in the next graph I'll show you. So it generates, it's actually not one third, it's uh, more 22%, so that's why you're, you're quite close. Um, and renewables sit actually at a very nominal 2%, uh, which is interesting. Um, and so quickly, yeah. Let's see, do, do, do. And according to the US Information Energy, Administration EIA. Um, so here's Korea just for geographic orientation. So it's heavily in, um, relied on imports. So it's 98% reliant on imports for its fossil fuel consumption needs that we saw before. And 85% of that comes from fossil fuels. So that's also problematic. And we can, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, also, South Korea is very natural resource poor. Unlike the US, which is well endowed with um, shale gas, uh, fracking, as we've heard a lot about. Also, we think about Canada, Alberta, the tar sands, we think of the Keystone XL pipeline. So these countries are very, certain countries are just very naturally resource endowed that they can use for energy. Unfortunately, that is not the case for Korea or for Taiwan or for Japan. So you can see how these countries exhibit very similar geographic challenges or, or geopolitical and uh, energy challenges. Also, it's one of the world's largest consumers energy consumers tonight in the world, and that's um, due to the fact that um, Korea is a highly developed economy, as we know. For those of us who live in Seoul or just anywhere, we think of KTX um, taking us to Seoul or anywhere in the country, it's very developed. And that's due in part to the export economy that, that really drives Korea. So we, electronics, so Samsung, L uh, LG, um, semiconductors, and also petrochemicals. Um, and also in, in terms of the, the poor resources, um, Korea has no international or natural gas pipelines currently. It relies exclusively on tanker um, shipments of LNG and crude oil for export. So that's also a problem uh, or a concern in terms of energy security. And we're going to talk about that term energy security in a little bit. So if you will indulge me again in another <laughs> audience participation activity. So now we're going to look at electricity generation. So again, of, of those um, fuel sources, what do you think how like nuclear is X percent? Like what do you all think? I kind of gave away one of them, but um, anyone? Any takers? Okay, what's your question? Um, so my question is, you know, of those fuel, of the fossil fuel sources for generating electricity, like how much of it like goes towards, goes towards electricity? Like coal is X percent of electricity, makes X percent of the country's electricity. Any thoughts? If not, it's fine. We can move on. <laughs> <laughs> Oil, like 60%? Okay. <laughs> At least you're participating. <laughs> um, so here are the numbers. So electricity generation. So nuclear is at 22%. Um, hydro is at 6 Other renewables at 7 So solar, wind. All natural gas, 30 So like not too, like half. <laughs> um, coal, 30%. Still pretty high and oil is at 4%. So when we look at some of those numbers, what, what kind of jumps out? Is, are these shocking? Are these kind of what you think? Any, yes? I think the nuclear is a little shocking in terms of like the percentage-wise. Mm -hmm. It's a very high percent, I would assume. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Anything else? Any reflections? No? Yes? I, mean, I guess the fact that like, thank you and reflecting how it's a very developed country, mm -hmm. Samsung, LG, that have a power and resources to do like more hydro for other renewables, mm -hmm. um, that it's just a small number. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of shocking. Also because it's supposed to be a small country, so yeah. theoretically could be more easily <coughs> implanted in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Um, to me, they seem high just based on how much the Korean public sentiment seems to complain about these things in other countries. Mm -hmm. Like the, all the pollution that comes from China, and yet there's yeah. Some high percentage of coal, yeah. and then everybody is terrified to go to Japan because of the, because of Fukushima, and yet there's still twenty two percent of nuclear here. Yes, yes. So exactly, these are the kind of like wait what kind of 
things, these initial reactions that I had, and that I, that I, uh, when I initially investigated energy policy, because you're like, wait, what? This doesn't make sense. So you're right. There's, there's a, a conflict. A conflict emerges between public perception and government policy, and this is what I investigated in my senior thesis. And I was just like, wait, Japan wants to increase nuclear policy? Like they want to? So right now, nuclear in Japan sits at less than three percent, and by 2024, they they want to increase that to 22 percent. Um, or by, I think by 2030, and you're just like, what? How does that make sense, right? It seems very counterintuitive. Uh, and again, we'll revisit this later in my research. But again, all the things that you all pointed out or that you're thinking right now, um, you're all on the money. So energy challenges. <coughs> so again, to orient ourselves uh, in Northeast Asia, we have Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, and the Korean Peninsula, as we refer to as in Latin. If any of you took Latin. Peninsula is a combination of two words, pine, meaning almost, insula, meaning island. We said seven years of Latin learning that, so I could bust that out at a, at a presentation. But it means almost island. And if you think about it, when we look at these, these nations, they're practically island, they are island nations, and we might as well make Korea, the peninsula, an island for these energy challenges. So energy security, this is an important term. Um, for governments when they are uh, crafting energy policy. So uh, EIA, International Energy Agency, defines it as the uninterrupted availability of energy resources at an affordable price. And that makes sense, right? For a government, you, you don't want this, the energy spigot to be turned off. Also, you want energy to be as cheap as possible. Um, but there are a number of shared regional challenges. So a uh, high depends on imports from the Middle East, oftentimes uh, politically unstable. Furthermore, they have to traverse through um, lanes, uh, sea lanes that are susceptible to uh, closure, instability. Things that come to mind are Straits of Hormuz, Straits of Malacca, um, that we might have heard about. Also, uh, naturally resource poor. Furthermore, um, from the government standpoint, there is a deep desire to diversify this energy mix, right? We can't always be reliant on the Middle East. Maybe we can diversify our trade partners, or maybe a lot of proponents say we can make more domestic sources, right? Um, U.S. has a lot of domestic, I mean, if we take the U.S. for example, shale gas, it's like we don't have to rely on the Middle East anymore. And we've seen gas prices at historic lows. So similarly, a lot of proponents for nuclear say, well, nuclear is kind of a domestic source, right? I mean, yeah, you may have to in, uh, import the uranium to some degree, but we don't have to rely on it as much as other um, sources. Uh, and then some examples, right, to ground this. So do you, I don't know if you all were in Seoul, but some of us were a couple weeks ago, or maybe last month, uh, KT Telecom. There was a huge fire. Did that affect other people and other, or you must have heard of it, right? Um, I'll never forget, I was on Itaewon that Friday night, and my phone was literally useless. <laughs> um, and then also, whatever store you went to, they're like, oh, sorry, our credit card machines are linked through KT, and we can't accept your credit card, cash only. And the millennial, they're like, I don't carry cash. <laughs> and then you try to go to KEB, Hana, to, to go to the ATM, and then they're like, sorry, our thing uses KT, and then you're totally cut off. So the point is, you know, we're so dependent on energy. And when one sector of the grid goes out, um, you're just like, ah, what do we do? Like, hopefully the backup works, but it takes time. And then also, if the backup isn't strong enough, you know, what does that mean? And then also, uh, the summer I was traveling to Europe with family. And then I was at an airport going to Hamburg, and then that airport had a huge blackout for three days. And we had to be rerouted, and thankfully we went to another German town to get into Hamburg. Um, but for two days, the whole airport was grounded, closed, people were angry, upset. Um, and I was like, oh, that's an energy problem, you know? There's a huge blackout, why, why weren't the generators better? So you can look at it from all different types of uh, views. So the point being is that there are very, there are a variety of ways to look at energy security, right? From the top level, the technocrats and the bureaucrats being like, we need to reduce um, dependence on the Middle East to the everyday person who's like, I just want the lights to turn on and not to pay a bajillion dollars for my gas bill. Um, so now we will transition to my research. So I'm very <laughs> fascinated by nuclear energy. And I think when we think, when people say nuclear, it's like very gloom and doom or the Simpsons um, where Homer Simpson works, um, but I'm interested in this political dimension. So I'm in, so again, it gets a bad raps, but you know it could prob um, solve problems in terms of 
being an alternative source of sorts to coal. It's, it's on certain regards cleaner, it's more powerful. Uh, but my research question was, how does political anchoring, and I'll get to that definition in a second, impact Korean attitudes towards nuclear energy? So political anchoring is this concept that your party affiliation, whether you're left or right, so if you take America, because we're all Americans, I think, um, you know, Republican, Democrat. And how does that become a cue used to evaluate risk or, or certain things? So if we take issues of immigration, health care, uh, wh whatever you want to call it, whatever policy, and your, your primary lens of analysis will be through the party. It won't even be through the facts, which is alarming. <laughs> you should always go through facts. Um, and so where am I? I'm in the early stages of my research. So I've completed a thorough lit review looking at a number of sources and I've been fortunate enough to meet with a number of experts in the area and initially craft my survey. So this kind of like nuclear reversal is what, my, what really jolted me last summer or whenever we, we had to draft our grants. So June 6, 2017, President Moon Jae-in currently, he stood before um, the country's oldest nuclear reactor and announced a pivotal change in nuclear energy policy. Uh, South Korea would phase out its nuclear-centered energy policy towards a nuclear-free era. So here is Moon Jae-in in front of Shin Kori. And for both myself and a lot of observers, this surprised us. Why? Because South Korea is actually one of the world's leading countries in nuclear technology and exporting it. In fact, I think they recently signed um, a agreement with Saudi Arabia to, uh, for Saudi Arabia to build a, um, either LNG or, or it was a nuclear um, facility. So it, it seems very counterintuitive. It's like, wait, you're like the world's leading manufacturer and t head uh, in this technology, but you're not using it um, for various reasons. Um, but that kind of um, shocked me and a lot of analysts out there. So that was kind of the, the impetus for this research study to be like, I need to be on the ground, be like, so here's what the government's saying, but what are the people saying? Again, the local voices. Because a lot of times the, voice, the local voices are suppressed through special interest groups um, and just lost, it's lost in the chaos. So research methods, how am I doing this? I'm using mixed methods, I'm doing a survey. Um, so creating a 30 question survey that measures political party affiliation and that also seeks to understand um, how voting and votes, um, how the voter rather um, interprets nuclear energy and sees other energy policy or energy sources. Uh, I'll administer this for two weeks at the end of February, and I partnered with uh, Research Korea, which is a uh, survey research firm that will administer my survey to a thousand people. So it'll be a representative sample. Yay, basic statistics. Okay. Um, so interviews. So I've interviewed uh, experts and locals. So there were two really, really great professors, Professor Chung Ji-boom of Ulsan uh, Institute of Technology, and then uh, Eun-sung Kim from Kyungi University. And turns out, funny enough, Eun Sung Kim is a Korean grantee of the Fulbright. So he is actually off to the US in January to begin his research. So I was looking at a CV or something and I was like, oh, Fulbright. And then I had coffee with Director Shim one time. I was like, is this, like, do you know this person? She's like, yeah, we reviewed his application. So it was great, um, like totally by happenstance that we were able to uh, meet, collaborate, and again, this is kind of what the Fulbright is about, right? It's about this academic interchange. Um, so it was really great to engage with that. So here's some sample questions. So this one was, uh, what's your opinion on the following items? Unfortunately, maybe you can read it. So one being like, uh, you know, climate, you're personally thinking that the climate of the world is changing. Yes, no, not sure. Um, climate change is a serious issue. Actions need to be taken immediately. Yes, no, not sure. Um, Ranging to nuclear power aggravates the problem of fine dust in Korea, right? So fine dust, another flashpoint. Um, and we can look at coal as being one of the usual suspects of this, right? Uh, another question, using the Likert scale, you know, how serious do you think the problem of climate change is right now? Please rank from 1 being not at all, or to 10 being um, super, or rather very serious. And then similar, same scale, uh, how f serious do you think um, the fine dust problem is in our country? and seeing if people can actually are associating fine dust with certain energy sources. And then furthermore, seeing you know, how that political party affiliation um, is tempering that as well. So continued, finally. Um, another question, please indicate your preference for each. You know, um, 
then the following energy sources are used to make electricity, like we talked about. So nuclear ranging all, you know, highly favorable, unfavorable, neutral, slightly favorable, highly favorable, not sure. And just for kind of orientation, so Korean political parties. So there are kind of four main groups. <coughs> we have the progressives, liberal, centrists, and then the conservatives. So this idea of interconnectedness that I kind of talked about. Um, it's a Tibetan Buddhist principle, and it's this understanding that all phenomena are connected with one another. So this is a very kind of abstract view of interconnectedness. But for me, it's actually served as a powerful framework to direct my life studies and my aspirations. And I think, um, especially in, in writing a Fulbright application for the personal statement, personal narratives, um, as we all kind of remember, you know, we're like, how do we craft like, the best narrative? Or your advisors would like, like look back, you're like, what made you what you are now? And I think doing a lot of reflection and self-analysis and asking myself the real tough questions of like, who am I? What do I, what do I want out of life? These kind of, these broad questions and narrowing it down and being like, and using this framework of interconnectedness, being like, okay, Taiwan, Japan, international politics, State Department, this, 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 and I'm like, oh, it kind of makes sense. So similarly, I invite you all, if you ever get a chance to reflect, um, to kind of see how the threads connect, because they do, whether we realize it um, overtly or not. And I think energy embodies this. Um, <coughs> and I want to get to this idea of interdisciplinary studies and the importance of it in terms of energy studies. So remember how I was like, oh, you know, how does gender studies and energy, how do they combine? Well, there's this idea called fuel poverty. Have any of you heard of fuel poverty or can kind of maybe guess? But <coughs> an example is we think of some, some countries which may be developing. So perhaps a certain country within Africa. And you kind of think of this a very rural village. And usually the woman, the wife, has to trek miles to collect firewood or some sort of energy fuel source while the husband is working, etc. So the, usually the, the woman of the house has to trek miles or kilometers to get this fuel source, bring it back into a sort of uh, poorly ventilated home, subsequently ignite it uh, for either warmth or for making food, and they inhale the carcinogenics. So um, the UN has actually done studies and has found in certain countries which experience fuel poverty, so like Nepal is an example, um, that women, so an uh, element of gender, women are dying and becoming more ill at higher rates than men, simply because of the inaccessibility of to energy. And this kind of branches off into another um, field of energy studies that I'm getting into called energy anthropology. So looking at how, so again, studies of anthropology, but looking at it through an energy lens, looking at how um, energy influences the way people live their lives, right? If, if you're like Homer Simpson and you have a nuclear power plant in your, in your town, in Springfield, it's kind of normal that people go to maybe like Springfield Vocational Technical School and then become a nuclear technician, right? And perhaps they vote a certain way. Perhaps they'll vote more conservative because the liberals want to, you know, drive hybrids and equal like that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we can we can kind of using that silly kind of example, we can see how energy impacts people's lives and the way. I mean, here in Seoul, right? Or you take Beijing for example, or New Delhi. We we wear masks, right? It literally affects the way we breathe because of a government's energy choice. So we see how energy choices begin to in. in influence the way humans lead their lives, essentially the study of anthropology. So it, it's, you know, you can get very deep and you can kind of like see which, which your specific discipline or interest connects to energy, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it, it does. And we see the economics, of course, right? The trade of energy, Ener energy deals, cooperation. So that's kind of a, a more obvious one that we think about. Um, so yeah, everything is connected. So there's this kind of nuclear dilemma. Um, so so people are like, you know, okay, how? What about Korea, New, South Korea, and nuclear? So nuclear has 24. Um, there are 24 power plants, and I'll show you the 24 um, sort of spread all around the peninsula. People are generally opposed. Um, however, um, proponents of nuclear say that it can resolve power issues. Um, I believe those of you who have stayed here in the summer or, or who know. To, um, South Korea is susceptible to a lot of blackouts, and that enrages a lot of people. 
And how do the citizens take that? How do they take it up? They take it out on the government. They protest. Um, so recently, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan had elections, and one of the, so it gained a lot of attention because Taiwan lost. I think um, gay marriage was not approved. Uh, but another ballot question, which wasn't sort of highly popularized, was the nuclear phase out, which Tsai Ing-wen was trying to push. Tsai Ing-wen was saying, you know, by 2025, um, nuclear is around 16%, and I think um, renewables was a small nominal amount, say 7. So by 2025, she had, back in 2014, she had suggested, or had a policy that said, we will slash all of that nuclear and tack that percentage on to renewables. Um, and people were like, yes, that's very awesome, that's cool, great. But when I was in Taiwan and I asked the energy economists at the, at the think tanks about this policy, they said, I'll never forget it, the guy said, it's mission impossible. <laughs> and mission impossible, I think, of like Tom Cruise and everything. But it, it is, I mean, feasibly, right? The technology or the policy, it was a very lofty and ambitious policy. And we saw, and it was put to referendum for the people. The, the government said, you have two years to kind of get your act together or show the people how you can make this feasible. And the people said, you know, we, we prefer not to phase out nuclear because a lot of our electricity, like we saw earlier, comes from nuclear. And what was the flashpoint? The flashpoint was a very large blackout in Taiwan this past summer. So again, perhaps an, uh, a blackout of similar magnitude could um, reasonably convince the Korean people to follow suit as well. So another concern um, which people have raised are earthquakes. Um, Japan, the, it was a combination of a tsunami and an earthquake. Taiwan susceptible to a lot of earthquakes as well. Fortunately, I didn't experience one, but um, the whole region, due to the geography tectonic place, are susceptible to earthquakes. And there was one in Gyeongju. Um, it didn't completely destroy the facility, but the, the, the facility was temporarily closed. So again, this is, a, this is a concern, right, for a lot of people. Um, so here are the 24 plants. Um, any pertinent data? So a lot of them are being phased out. So on the right column, you can see a number of them being phased out in the next seven to 10 years. Um, so I've been to a couple of conferences. So <coughs> I've seen both sides of the argument. So this one is the International Regional Workshop on Fourth Industry-Based Advanced Nuclear Decommissioning Techniques. <laughs> That's a mouthful. And I'll never forget it. Um, I was coming up the stairs from the train station. And I didn't even know about this conference, but I saw the sign. And I walked past it. And I was like, oh, that actually looks kind of interesting. <laughs> and then I went back, and I was like, I think I should go to this. And it was on my campus. And I went, and it was very informational, because I heard about the other side, which was you know, we need to phase out nuclear, we need to decommission them, you know, we can, here's the technology to bolster renewables or other sources. Whereas the converse, I went to a conference, it was the Northeast uh, Asia International Electric Power Forum. So while, while not nuclear, it was about electricity. And I got some really good takeaways from that, which I can share to you about in this next slide about geopolitics. So now we're going to transition to the last phase of the presentation. And I'm actually doing really good on time. I'm so impressed. <laughs> um, so geopolitics. Um, as a person who's interested in international affairs, um, geopolitics is so interesting, especially with the lens of energy. You know, we can look at geopolitics through different um, angles. There's traditionally like the hard mill, um, hard policy, like you know, wars, but here's sort of the softer side with energy. So here we have Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un, and right there's this recent rapprochement between the two nations. Um, I think it's pretty surreal to be in, on the peninsula while this happens. I think there was you know murmurs that Kim Jong-un was supposed to come before the end of this year, but obviously that's not happening. Maybe we'll see that happen towards the beginning or the middle of 2019. So they have, you know, how does the geopolitics get involved in this? Well, unfortunately, this, you can't see this infographic, but uh, there is an existing pipeline here from Russia. Um, I think I'll send this. Um, so Russia is a very powerful um, uh, 
country in terms of exercising energy diplomacy, a lot of pipelines through Russia, or a lot of Europe gets its energy through Russia. And there's an example, I think, in Ukraine, uh, where very important, and so like if we remember um, the, oh no, the, the province is escaping me. Um, the one that was Anna, Crimea. So uh, a very important pipeline travels through Crimea to get energy. And now Russia has created a pipeline that circumvents Ukraine. So Ukraine had a very powerful bargaining chip against Russia to say that we can turn it off if you don't agree with us. And so Russia's hands could tied. So my point is that Russia is a very important geopolitical power in terms of providing energy to not only Europe but the region. So there's actually a Trans-Korea gas pipeline in the works or being discussed about that would connect Russia or provide um, gas from Russia through North Korea through to South Korea. And that kind of addresses this concern about energy security, right? So we no longer have to be reliant on Middle Eastern energy. We can finally harness or, or utilize Russia's um, energy war. But from the U.S. point standpoint, I would argue that that's a little alarming to the U.S. because Russia and China are now sort of pulling a traditionally very close American ally into its orbit of influence and away from US, um, the U.S. partnership that the U.S. has enjoyed for many years. I mean, I think we can all remember when uh, recently President Trump said, oh, maybe we should suspend military exercises with Korea. Furthermore, maybe we should pull out of Korea. It, it's a bad deal, he says. It's actually a really good deal for us because the, the Korean government is, is actually putting more of the money up front than we are. So again, the geopolitics, right? Um, so now we can look at the U.S. So how does the U.S., how would the U.S. want to pull Korea, South Korea, back into its orbit of influence? Well, the U.S. is actually a very strong trading partner in terms of liquefied natural gas. So it imported 110.4 billion cubic feet of LNG, which uh, is equivalent to 22.5% of, per of the nation's total imports. So that is not a small sum by any means. And because, if we've all heard of shale gas and fracking and, and what that revolution has done for the U.S., the U.S. is now, a, I, I read that the U.S. actually is able to produce more gas than Russia and at cheaper rates. So it makes sense commercially that the U.S. would want to engage more with um, South Korea and, on this and, and to sort of um, provide more credence to that. I was at the U.S. Embassy uh, two days ago and I had a meeting with the, uh, one of the commercial foreign commercial service officers who works for the Department of Commerce. So within the U.S. Embassy, there's, uh, there are attaches from the Department of Commerce. And one, per one particular um, person covers energy. So I was like, oh, cool, we can talk about this. And the U.S. companies are very, very interested in coming to Korea creating more LNG terminals, liquefied natural gas, regasification terminals, because LNG, you have, to, because like, yeah, if you remember your physics, um, you have to like cool down gas to an extremely cold temperature to transport it. And that takes a lot of time, energy, money. And then you have to put it on a ship, and you have to send the ship all the way, you know, under Africa and all the way over, eventually to the port, maybe in Incheon. And then all, and what, and in order to regasify that, you have to heat it up again, right? And then that's basic physics. Um, so there's a lot, again, the, the economics behind it, right? To build a regasification, the, the kind of contracts you can make, local jobs, um, this all kind of makes sense in terms of the economics and how energy is connected. Um, so it could bring a, the trade deal could bring South Korea and the US closer, and again, away from Russia and China's orbit of influence, which the US wants to do. But increasingly, when a Russia or North Korea deal seems more attractive, we can see, or we, we look at President Moon's sort of agenda. A lot of Koreans uh, are voicing complaints that this current administration is prioritizing uh, a reunification over the the economy and jobs and etc. Um, and then we kind of see well who's kind of behind North Korea. Oh, you know, a lot of Russian influence, a lot of Chinese influence. And we kind of see how if, if there's a reunification, it can kind of push uh, South Korea a little bit out of um, the US's orbit of influence. So again, the geopolitics is very interesting in terms of this push and pull. Um, so in terms of China, 
So this is very interesting. There is actually in the works a Northeast Asian super grid. Super grid? Can anyone read this? What does it say? Super grid. Good, I tested you all. Go away. Um, so it, it's, this very, it's this grand vision that connects Russia, Japan, Korea, China, Mongolia, all together to make one super grid, as it were. And this is very important because China and Mongolia have abundant renewable energy sources that they can harness um, in terms of the geography. And a lot of people, uh, I'll, I'll give you Taiwan for an example. Um, people say, why are the renewables so low? You know, why can't you just stick windmills, um, wind turbines, and, and solar panels everywhere? And the energy economist reminded me that Taiwan's topography is very mountainous. Similarly, South Korea is very mountainous. So it's, it's quite difficult, you know, to stick a uh, wind turbine, you know, on sort of like a not e uneven plane, because you kind of need like very flat land, right? Um, so that's kind of like one reason. Um, and this is actually set to be built in, or, co or commence in 2022. So very soon. And currently, there are no um, gas pipelines that connect um, South Korea with Russia or, or with the, the, the world because it's so reliant on imports. So, how, so this Northeast Asia super grid, so what, what's one sort of knock against it? Well, you have to dig all these underground tunnels under the water to bring the electric or the electricity to South Korea and to connect it into the grid. So that's, that's, that's a huge challenge um, for a lot of people. I mean, I'm not an engineer like you, but, um, but I imagine there are a whole host of issues there. Um, so kind of wrapping up soon, so again, looking at China. Um, so here we have the South Korean Minister of Trade Economy um, and Energy meeting with the director of China's um, National Energy Administration, so their sort of counterpart. Um, to discuss gas, nuclear power, and new industries in relation to the Northeast Asian supergrid that we just saw. Um, so that was in December uh, 2017. So very recent talks. So Korea is very adamant in getting involved and integrated into Northeast Asia and you know, solving their energy security problems and their energy issues. While that's, while that's all good and important, and you know, for any nation, they should prioritize themselves. Again, for the U.S., they're like, oh, but, you know, Russia, China, North Korea, you know, they're like, we want to kind of bring you back into the fold. And this is the kind of, mm, I personally think, sort of refocusing on Asia. You know, under, uh, I believe it was the Clinton, administ Clinton um, administration in the State Department, there was a very brief sort of pivot to Asia and that carried on into, well, it was under Clinton, and then sort of um, under Kerry, it, it moved and focused more on the Middle East. And I think now there's a real re, people call it the re-pivot to Asia. And I think there's a real refocusing on Asia and the importance of it. Clearly, we, we can look at um, the meeting between Kim Jong-un and President, um, President Trump in Singapore um, earlier this year as, as a sign of that. Um, so that should, I hope this has kind of left you with some questions and thinking more about energy and has um, I've gotten to show you sort of my research, my understandings and interests of it, and I hope um, you can leave this, this um, small conversation thinking about how energy is connected in your life, and sort of taking away interconnectedness and being like, how can I apply this to my life, you know, uh, as a scholar, as a teacher, or as a person, because all of your interests um, are all connected. Um, so that's the conclusion of my presentation. You all have been a very um, great audience. Um, I'm really excited to share this with you. So I'm here to answer any of your questions, have conversations, etc. So this was 43 minutes. I'm very surprised I did this. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
what's it like here? What what do you know so far? What do you expect maybe? What do you mm -hmm. think you might find from your survey? Mm -hmm. um, what What is sort of driving these uh, opposing feelings towards nuclear energy? Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with public perception again. So we look at Fukushima as a slash point. And even when I was in Taiwan, I would go to all these great cafes. You know, there's, there's amazing ca cafe culture here, as we know. But I would consistently see little cloth banners that said, no nukes, no Fukushima, put up. And usually, these, uh, that would indicate that these cafes are liberal leaning, or these people are liberal leaning. I mean, you know, if someone has like a Greenpeace laptop sticker, you know, that's another indicator, right? Or whatever kind of um, social movement that you're an advocate for. Bumper stickers, right? right. I haven't seen bumper stickers here, are they? No. <laughs> I guess it's just an American thing, or a Western thing. Um, but to, to revisit your question, I think a lot of the younger constituents of South Korea, yay, the pizza's here, <laughs> um, they are more worldly, and they're a little more in tune and connected than, say, their older parents, or people of that vintage. And what's interesting that I've uncovered in my lit review is that the older generation really support nuclear because it is an indicator of South Korea's, how do I want to put it, sort of ascension to the world stage of technological advancement, of becoming the world's ninth um, largest user, user of energy, and to have such an exponential growth. So for the older generation, nuclear actually uh, represents success it represents um, technological advancement, um, the atom itself. I, I was talking to um, Professor Chung, I forget which one organization, their insignia was an atom. It might have been one of the conservative parties because that um, represents technological advancement, success, um, in terms of the nuclear power, which brought them to the world stage. So that's, that's that opposition side. But in terms of the liberals, um, or what I expect to see, I expect to see younger voters um, especially those who have gone to school, who are college educated, um, even even conservatives who have gone to uh, who have uh, high levels of education, uh, but especially towards the younger, I expect them to see you know, or to exhibit more um, left leaning, liberal, uh, anti nuclear sentiments, and more towards renewables, or more towards renewables. Yeah. Uh, yes, back there. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering what classified your mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. So the survey is currently um, under works right now. I haven't um, partnered currently with Research Korea, but I have devised a sample research instrument, and I'm administering that locally um, at my university. And then I was going to, after I do kind of a little test sample, I would take that with um, Research Korea. Um, I have a question that I haven't quite figured out sure. the word yet, so speak with me. No. Um, in my day-to-day -day interactions with any Korean people in my life, mm -hmm. um, in response to energy sources, mm -hmm. um, which is almost always brought on by the fact that it's a bad dust day outside, mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's a really big cognitive dissonance in Korea between first-hand experience and their personal discomfort and then also public sentiment. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, everybody's wearing a mask, they have a cough, their throat hurts, and they can't see five feet in front of their face, but everyone publicly likes to blame China for the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and only, like, this last, like, two weeks ago did I ever see an actual public statement from a um, high up, I can't remember if it was a like, government figure or like, scientist in the government mm -hmm. saying that Korea should take responsibility for its emissions in mm -hmm. terms of dust rather than blaming China all the time. That was the first time I've ever actually seen mm -hmm. somebody important come out and say that. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you think this cognitive dissonance about, you know, sort of, it's like not even towing the party line, it's towing the country line mm -hmm. about where the problem is. How do you think this is, like, how much slower do you think that is making 
green energy as like a viable option. Because like you said, they can't just stick wind turbines everywhere mm -hmm. and solar panels on top of everything and suddenly make a dam out of you know right. out the country. Um, so I do recognize that there's not a lot of options in terms of those kinds of renewable resources, but I feel like because of the public sentiment, it's just reeling back the drive to find different sources and cleaner sources because because there's a lack of taking responsibility for their own emissions, but also a lack of resource in the sort of layman public's eye mm -hmm. about what they can even do about it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, well, we can't do anything, and this is China's fault, so mm -hmm. we're just not going to do anything. How much do you think this is like really slowing the progress mm -hmm. in Korea as opposed to other nations? Mm. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing your, your observation and your personal experience with it because I know that's what a lot of uh, expats, foreigners, Koreans are also sort of grappling and wrestling with. Um, it's great that you've come across this, so I'd always say, you know, stay woke. <laughs> uh, be as, you know, literate about this as possible, but also realize that, you know, the government, it's a very convenient narrative for the government, spin, political spin, we can say, right? For the government to say, oh, it's China, uh, it's a bad dust day, it's China, even in Taiwan. Um, obviously, we know the kind of Taiwan-China relations, but uh, consistently I would hear, you know, ah, oh, it's from China. But there are coal plants in Taiwan. There are coal plants here. Um, and, you know, in some, I mean, if you take places like New Delhi, um, which has terrible rates, uh, people just literally burn garbage. And that, you can't do that. You can't just burn tires, you know, just to, get, to clear space. Or, um, but I think it all comes down to, or, or one sort of way to help the populace sort of become more aware um, is through more research and through public um, outreach campaigns. Um, and, you know, but that's also indicative on the government too. What if the government, and, and, and a special interests as well. Um, through my conversations I've learned that the nuclear proponents, uh, here there's actually a nuclear mafia of sorts. Um, so if we think of a revolving door, which is the term in public administration, where you know someone high up in a certain um, company or, or field, um, they work there, and then after they quit, they work in the regulatory agency, and they kind of cycle in, cycle in, cycle in. And there's there's you know um, special interests in, in under the table kind of agendas, and we kind of see that, and we see those powers sort of suppressing those narratives. Um, but I think you know more think tanks could do a you know a better job of doing the independent research and publishing those and somehow getting it more into the public sphere and um, in conversation, and then also from the government side. Hopefully, and it depends on the administration, of course, too. Um, so I'm curious, you know, if, if that person was from the current ruling party or from the opposition party, um, it, that they were comfortable enough to make that statement and and um, produce research and stuff like that. But I think it comes down to a lot of people sort of educating themselves. Uh, but it, but that's easier said than done, right? You know, you know there are so many issues you can take domestically in the U.S., uh, but you don't know all the details. And you, you, while the onus is on you to do it, you're just like, eh, do I really want? It's like uh, unless it's like scrolling my Facebook feed, you know, after the meme page, I'm like, oh, that's cool, <laughs> which is really sad. And maybe we can get Facebook to make algorithms. I don't know. Um, but I think it's very important, especially in terms of the renewables, because. The nuclear mafia that I was speaking about, these special interest groups, are actually actively working against or sort of suppressing people and organizations within um, the environmental and the renewable because they're very territorial. Because, again, you know, think about this, yeah, I'll just go with that example. They're very territorial, and any kind of encroachment into their territory uh, is threatening increased renewables is very threatening to the nuclear industry, to the coal industry, to the oil industry. So kind of under, so taking a more like macro view and, and being like, who are the power players here? And um, really realizing that you know the small, the everyday person, their voice is really not heard at the end of the day. And that's very troubling. So how do we incorporate their voices into the larger conversation? So kind of thinking about all those things together. Yeah? Um, what are like some of the big factors that went into like shaping your personal view on nuclear mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I think for me it's a combination of reading the literature, but then also going to a community and like literally going inside of a nuclear power plant um, to being like, wow, this is very, you know, interesting. 
I mean, I don't think a lot of people go to like energy facilities in general. Um, but I do see the merits of nuclear energy, and I think to an extent it does get a bad rap simply because of the history. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima. These are, these are immediate being like, nah. Um, but then also, a, a very legitimate argument is what about the nuclear waste? How do you get rid of that? I, like, again, using Simpsons, like the Simpsons movie, I think like a frog mutates. And then, you know, people are like, well, I don't want my like fish to have five eyes when I eat it, and, right? There's that kind of, that line. But there's actually been very good technology in terms of storing nuclear waste and looking at the radio, the rates of radioactive decay. Um, there have been methods of storing them um, within like, rock beds and putting them within, enclosing them in salt. I think that um, like really prolongs or like reduces the radioactive um, qualities of it. Um, so I actually, um, I am not a math science guy by any means, but I took a physics class on energy my senior spring. I did not have a relaxing senior spring. <laughs> uh, but I said, you know, I'm doing energy stuff. I need to be somewhat conversant in the science behind it. And we actually did um, problem sets on a whole variety of sources, including nuclear, and how powerful it can be and how efficient it can be compared to other sources. It's very clean comparatively to um, nuclear, uh, uh, to coal and, and oil. Uh, so there's one positive in that aspect. So kind of actually doing the, the math and everything, I have a greater appreciation for the, for that technical side and the, the quantitative side. I think you had a question, didn't you, Shona? Or maybe Alan's Yeah, no, it? I mean, parts of them have already been answered because I thought that this was also yeah. something that I was going to ask about um, and maybe tie into a question about, for instance, can South Korea, without nuclear power, even live up to commitments in the Paris Agreement, for instance? So how does the government yeah. side of these square that circle. <laughs> I mean, you could do what the U.S. didn't pull out of the Paris Accord. <laughs> um, that, that, that solves it. Um, but again, you're right, you know, we, if a country signs onto the Paris Accords, in a sense, or a Kyoto Protocol, which I think a lot of countries have already broken, including Japan, to say, you know, we want to keep emissions level this low. And, you know, if, and nuclear kind of allows you to do that. So you can kind of see how nuclear makes sense in certain aspects. Um, so that's how I got interested. Yeah. Um, I know you're mostly building on Sixia nuclear, and then we were talking about two different facets of like pro and against. I was wondering if you found the same thing for coal in aspects of like people who are completely against mm. coal, or is in terms of is there like facets of the Korean um, society who believe in like using coal scopers, like zero emission cycles, type mm. things like that, mm -hmm. and whether um, Within like the liberal community, they could possibly see renew like using nuclear sources as an alternative for coal until the renewable energies get up to a point that they can have reliable dependency mm -hmm. upon it. Mm -hmm. I wish voters were like that. <laughs> I wish they could see the merits of and have sort of being like a compromise instead of being like no completely. Um, I haven't gotten to my research that far to see how people associate with with coal, but again, I can use my previous experience of. of being in South Korea, uh, in Taiwan, and being in that community that had a nuclear power plant, and a lot of people actually being for it, because I can very well imagine that those communities are receiving subsidies from the government to host such a power facility, coal, coal plant, and then um, they can use that money towards improving their schools or, or their roads, etc. Um, but then also looking at the economic component of it, the jobs, right? We want we can look back at the Pennsylvania coal country, right? Um, a lot of people would, uh, who work in these industries would obviously be vehemently opposed um, because it threatens their, um, their livelihoods that they've had for a lot of time. So kind of seeing how energy is actually interconnected to a lot of different things, um, that's what really gets me excited about energy. Um, but to kind of revisit your, your statement about you know, the coal cycles in terms of that, I, I think it's very viable. I think, you know, I think the country should look at all options available on the table. Um, but also be cognizant of the international agreements that it, it, you know, it has committed itself to. Also while addressing concerns of the environment and also, you know, fine dust. That's a huge flashpoint for Koreans. 
So I think all in all, the, the government has to really carefully consider all components, but then also for the populace to be more educated and to have these debates and discussions. Mm -hmm. Actually, okay. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. <laughs> I was wondering um, how much you thought that the public had a um, sway over versus like the conglomerates, like Samsung. Mm -hmm. What kind of dichotomy have you seen within that, as opposed to like, the companies have more power over mm -hmm. different nuclear policies versus not? Mm -hmm. Again, looking at this idea of special interests and you know these big things. So again, in the American context, you can think of the NRA, right? The big bad NRA. Um, Actually, there's an NRA in, in East Asia. It's called the Nuclear Regulatory Agency. <laughs> Equally as bad <laughs> uh, NRA kind of idea. Um, and it's hard because a lot of these people, again, this idea of the revolving door, people who are like CEOs of the coal companies end up coming into the regulatory agency itself. And you're like, well, isn't there some sort of bias, obvious bias there? Um, so it's very hard to sort of shake the stranglehold that the conglomerates have over influencing energy policy and the special interests that they kind of, uh, and, the, and, the, and the large support that they provide to politicians through things like campaign finance laws. I don't know anything about that here, but one can imagine that there, there are sort of parallel um, instances that we see in the US. However, if we look at an event in Taiwan, like that huge blackout, or we see consistent health issues, or we see the, the Korean populace saying, enough is enough, you know. I don't want to live in a one, like, for a week in a blackout, or I want to um, not develop bronchitis because of the fine dust. So I think if the people really do rally and it comes to a voting or it comes to a referendum, I mean, Vox Populi is very powerful in getting, um, in, in overturning agenda, and we've seen that um, successfully in Taiwan. Uh, maybe one last question from I think it was Lauren or something. Or, uh, or we'll take you too. We'll take you. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of related to a lot of other questions. Also, thank you so much for your great presentation. Um, it gave me a lot to think about while I stood here in Seoul. But um, kind of like you said, in Taiwan, you had the chance to like, go to some of these communities uh, living near or in a town where a reactor is. Um, I know here, like, the restrict barriers obviously a big thing, and your survey says data will probably give you a good look at the whole country, but do you have any plans to maybe go to some of these places where reactors are currently still active and in place in Korea? I would love to. Um, and that's again the energy anthropology, right? You get to talking to someone and being like, so here's this huge coal stack, like what do you think about this? You know, <laughs> Do you hate it? Do you love it? Do you feel like ambivalent about it? And this is the kind of um, social science research methods, which is really, really lacking in energy policy studies, because a lot of the, the leading energy policy um, journals, um, they all focus on the quant element, the technical aspect, which is obviously very important. But how do we translate human voices into the policy, right? Um, so I'm excited to do that. But there's actually one um, journal called Social Science, I don't know, social, Energy Research and Social Science. And there's a conference happening in May and I submitted an abstract for that. So hopefully I can present my work there and I can talk with other scholars about um, how to introduce more social science methods into um, energy policy discussions. So um, one of the professors, he's down in Ulsan, down south, and there's actually a nuclear reactor there. So I think through connecting with him, I can actually go down to a site visit there, have some people arrange interviews or something and, and talk to local people there. So that I'm really excited about, hopefully when it's warmer spring. But actually, doesn't the fine dust get worse in the spring? Yeah. Okay, never mind. <laughs> One last question from you. Um, I was kind of interested uh, if you knew of any efforts um, like to solve the revolving door problem, because mm -hmm. like you're trying to balance, you know, the having people who are on these various agencies who have experience in the field, which obviously is the people who work in the field, but also not have that inherent bias that goes in there. Mm -hmm. But also kind of tying more into like, you know, I think there's been more of a focus lately on like the effect of social media and mm -hmm. different methods of like informing people who eventually become voters on these issues. Mm -hmm. So like how much money and like what industries and what leaders like Samsung and LG and like these other really powerful lots of money companies are they having on the social media spin mm -hmm. of these issues and like are there any efforts to regulate that? Mm -hmm. Or like yeah, I'm kinda interested in that angle since like big media is yeah. 
That's a really great question. Um, in terms of the, the um, revolving door, uh, can't really solve that because it's a huge public administration issue. <laughs> um, but it's a really, it's a tough one, right? And in, in the context of disinformation, in the context of how companies are exerting disinformation sometimes or persuading voters who are almost always on their mobile devices, absorbing information through like not The Economist or not The Wall Street Journal or the equivalent here, right? That's been synthesized for them in a very intelligent, cogent manner. They're just like, oh, it's this tweet or here's a video or whatever. Um, so again, I think it's the onus on the, the constituent to be a little cognizant and to be a little like, always be a little skeptical, right? I think all of our teachers, especially about history, right? They're like, be a little skeptical about this, right? Um, because I, or like, stay woke, literally. It's like, you have to be like, you have to be like, is this like fake news? Is this, is this real? Um, and, 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 and do a little bit of that interconnected tracing, right? It's like, here's a tweet, you know? Where did that come from? Oh, it came from this company. Where does this company get money? It's like, oh, Samsung. It's like, or, oh, this like Kepco, Korean energy, um, electric company, it's like, hmm, it's like, maybe I should be a little more skeptical, maybe I should do a little more research. Uh, but it's very, it's, I think the government should, I think people in general should be very cognizant, but then also skeptical. And then furthermore, um, I mean, recently in Congress, um, the CEO of Google was summoned um, to, to talk about um, how Google conducts or generates images or, or searches, right, or hits on searches. Um, and, you know, that really does raise questions about should there be actual regulation and should there be legislation about the internet in terms of, you know, how information is categorized, how it's um, cleared, um, cleared in the sense of like approved. Um, so all really, really interesting questions, which I have no answers for. <laughs> but I, I want to thank you all for being a really, really attentive audience. And we've actually hit the one hour mark. So like 40 minutes of you know presentation, 20 minutes of questions. So I, we, we did it. <laughs> um, so I think we should celebrate with pizza and fruit. <laughs> so, so thank you really a lot. I really do appreciate it. And you, you all have also given me a lot to think about. So thanks.